chair of the night table. <laughs> because <laughs> Next time we will take a mad camel ride uh, through Islam uh, and uh, try to draw some conclusions to the whole series of lectures on the power of unreason. Now, a great deal of this is historical because I am trying to explain these things in historical sequence uh, to uh, find uh, their true meaning. The only direct sources we have for the origin of the Hebrews are the mythical accounts in the biblical book of Genesis. These accounts center around the lives of the so-called patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. On the whole, the narratives present a true picture of life in the Fertile Crescent during the years 2000 B.C. to 1500 B.C., when the Semites, or rather when Semitic speakers of the North Central group of Semitic languages enter the stage of history. According to biblical tradition, the original home base of the Hebrews was around a city called Haran, H-A-R-R-A-N, now in southeastern Turkey. I say home base because the very name Hebrew is a Babylonian word which means a wanderer or nomadic soldier of fortune who attaches himself to a host people as an ally uh, and who then negotiates the acquisition of some grazing ground for his flocks. The particular group descended from Abraham were attached to a warlike people called the Hurrians, H-U-R-R-I-A-N-S. We know this because the Hebrews adopted certain Hurrian customs, such as the custom of selling one's birthright, or in the case of a woman, stealing one's father's gods in order to make sure that one's father's uh, uh, possessions come um, ultimately into the possession of one's husband. The Hebrews in the beginning spoke Aramaic, uh, a uh, Semitic dialogue. Hebrew was the language they acquired from the Canaanites, the previous inhabitants of Palestine, or Canaan. After arriving in Canaan, they encamped in tents, mostly near the Canaanite cities. They herded sheep, goats, and cattle, and practiced seasonal agriculture. The Hebrews revered as their ancestor a man called Abraham. They were descended from him and his wife Sarah through their son Isaac, who was, I think we're getting into mythology now, conceived when Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90. <laughs> you can always tell when the mythology starts. And... Uh, Abraham had previously begotten another son, Ishmael, I-S-H-M-A-E-L, by Sarah's maid, Hagar, H-A-G-A-R, from whom the Arabs are descended, according to both the Jews and the Arabs. That's one thing they're agreed on. Abraham worshipped a god called El, strong one, the plural of which Elohim is used for God in certain component documents of the Bible. The religion of Abraham was roughly the following. He and his, first, he and his descendants are the objects of the God's loving care. In return, the God asks for obedience, whose ordinary expression is prayer and animal sacrifices at outdoor altars, at stone pillars and sacred trees. God promises land and many descendants. Then there is personal call by the God, uh, promise 
of coming uh, good fortune. Absent is the note of jealousy on the part of the god, or any note of tension with other gods or people regarded as outsiders. It is important to note that the Canaanites also called their chief god El. From El, of course, comes Allah. Abraham made his first land purchase in Canaan at a place called Hebron, H-E-B-R-O-N, which is today venerated by both Jews and Muslims as his tomb. Now, there's no external confirmation for Abraham, but the logic of the myth and its general picture of conditions places him about 1750 B.C. as a contemporary of Hammurabi, the king of Babylon. The biblical tradition continues that all the descendants of these people went down into Egypt, where eventually they were enslaved, and then led out in a sensational rescue mission led by a man named Moses, acting under the direction of a god with a new name, Yahweh, Y-A-H-W-E-H, Yahweh. So God now takes on a new name, formerly El, sometimes in the plural Elohim. God is now Yahweh, uh, who claimed to be identical with the original God El. That's what he said to Moses when he appeared to him in the burning bush, I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. Moses is also have said to deliver to have delivered to the people a law authored by Yahweh. None of this has any support in contemporary Egyptian documents, not even the alleged drowning of the Egyptian pharaoh as the sea closed back on his army after having parted to let the Hebrews through. Of course the crucial question is what really happened at the time, but it is very difficult to reconstruct this. The key to the reconstruction is to be found, I think, in the idea that far out in the desert, Moses forcefully initiated his followers into a new religion, new and yet old, for he forced them to return to a more primitive, more patriarchal form of Semitic tribalism than they had known for many generations. He forced them to turn away from their, under, under, from their understandable desire to assimilate to the urban civilization of Egypt and to its customs. Now, no one denies now that the name Moses is an Egyptian name. Moses was more assimilated than the other uh, Israelites. He turned back violently from his course of assimilation, uh, when he realized that the path of assimilation was leading to slavery for many of the Jews. When he saw a labor, labor boss beating an Israelite, Moses killed him and escaped out into the desert where he was welcomed by another more primitive Semitic tribe, uh, the Kenites of Midian. sometimes called Midianites. And from this tribe he got uh, his wife. These people were smiths, the Kenites. There in the desert at Mount Sinai, he had the vision of God in the burning bush, the God who announced himself under a new name and who gave Moses the mission of leading the Israelites out of Egypt into a land of milk and honey, the land, the old land of Canaan. But before he is to bring them into Canaan, he is to bring them to, quote, this hill, bring them to, quote, this hill, unquote. Thus, Moses had gotten his vocation in the desert as the primitive shamans did, as John the Baptist would, as Jesus did as the monks of the desert will in time. Moses was to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and bring them to this hill. He did just that. 
He initiated a whole people at once at Mount Sinai. Now, some scholars uh, believe that he really conducted a vast initiation ceremony here with all the theatrical effects which a primitive tribe uh, have at initiation ceremonies. There's, for instance, a Dutch scholar named Erdmans, who in his book, The Covenant of Sinai, uh, hypothesizes, it's merely a hypothesis, that the tribe of Kenites, the Smiths, uh, produced sound effects by beating large drums and uh, waving torches and so forth and so on. And this is uh, the basis of the great experience of awe, which the Hebrews all had. But that's merely a speculation. There was, I think, an initiation ceremony in which he initiated them into a new way of life uh, whose fundamental features were the worship of one God. Uh, this is called henotheism, the worship of one God without any statement as to whether there does really exist any other God. This one people is to worship this one God. Two, uh, the banning of female partners to the deity. Female partners are out. This God <laughs> goes it alone. Three is the banning of all magic and sorcery whatsoever. Remember that in the lecture on primitive religion, I identified magic and sorcery as one form that religion can take. Moses is committing uh, the Hebrew people totally to the personal form. No magic or sorcery. Or let's do it this way. Magic or sorcery out. Four. Images out. No images. Now why do you think images would be banned? Remember the role of images in primitive religion? What? No, that's not what I'm thinking of. There's may, there may be some truth. In well, that might be part of it. There's a more basic thing. You have a control over the image. You can uh, get it up in the morning, uh, 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 give it a shower, uh, 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 lead it in procession to its female partner at night the way the Hindus do. Uh, you can uh, give it a present. Uh, uh, you can start beating it if it doesn't do what you want. Uh, all control over the deity is uh, uh, abdicated in the banning of all images. The five, all Israelites are initiated, not just some, as in adolescent uh, puberty initiations, or as in mystery religions. Uh, six, tribal equality. And you might call it democracy, I'm going to put that in quotes, rather than the highly structured hierarchical society of the Egyptians. Uh, no emphasis on life after death.
All these things were in conscious rejection of the Egyptian religion. The Egyptian, Egyptian religion, you had polytheism. You had the cult of Osiris and his sister wife, Isis. You had magic, sorcery, and amulets. You had sculptured and painted images of deities. You had initiation mysteries in which individuals were initiated in those ceremonies. You had perhaps the most sensational belief in immortality and care of the dead than you had in any other religion. And you had a highly stratified class society. Now Moses gave his followers the tribes that he had brought together, a code, the earliest version of which, thanks again to the Holiday Inn and the Gideons, uh, is Exodus 19 through 24, chapters 19 through 24. This was promulgated about 1250 BC. It follows the form of a Near Eastern treaty, setting forth at the beginning the historical background the purpose and nature of the undertaking, the benefits, the promises, the curses. It's a treaty between God and a people. God is to be a totalitarian ruler whose mere wish is to govern every aspect of the people's lives. The heart of the code are the Ten Commandments or Decalogue, which are to be found in Exodus 20, 1 through 17. All crimes are sins and all sins are crimes. That is a crucial feature. All breaches of the law offend God. Restitution to other people whom you may have hurt is not enough. God requires expiation and this may involve drastic punishment. In other codes, a husband may forgive an adulterous wife and her lover. The Mosaic Code orders both of them to be put to death no matter what the husband may think. The Mosaic Code was far stricter in matters of sex than other Near Eastern codes. All irregular forms of sex were banned. Incest was regarded as particularly horrible and was defined so as to include marriage with cousins. To quote a few provisions, quote, whoever sacrifices to any god except Yahweh shall be solemnly destroyed, unquote. Quote, a witch shall not be permitted to live, unquote. Quote, very important one now, if you lend money to any poor man, you shall not exact interest from him. If you lend money to any poor man, you shall not exact interest. What is being prohibited here? Usury, yes. Now, the Jews in practice forbade the taking of interest from fellow Jews, but allowed it to uh, people outside, uh, non-Jews, you see. So the Jews were permitted uh, to uh, uh, lend money at interest to other people. But when Christianity and Islam uh, universalized this code, you see, they forbade taking of interest, period. They took the basic Jewish idea and they universalized what was a tribal prohibition. Quote, if you take a fellow countryman's garment as a pledge, you must give it back to him by sundown, for that is the only rug he has. What else does he have to sleep in? Quote, you shall give the firstborn among your sons, unquote. You shall give me the firstborn among your sons. About this, the, the biblical commentaries say only that the commandment must have envisaged the redemption of the firstborn by substitute sacrifices, as in the case of Abraham. This was a big thing in the, in the Near East, uh, uh, the sacrifice of uh, firstborn children. The Phoenicians used to throw them into fiery furnaces uh, which were sculptured like the god Moloch. And uh, the, great, uh, the great drama of the beginning of the uh, children of Israel is what happens when 
uh, God demands that Abraham sacrifice Isaac, his son, and then says, in effect, I didn't mean it. Here's an animal that you can substitute for him. And ever since that time, uh, it, it has been a particularly horrible crime in Judaism to mistreat children. And always the opposite attitude has been maintained, that we treat our children well. Many of the provisions of the law are more humane than other codes. Actually, the statement, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, is a mitigation of the primitive idea of two for one. Uh, so <laughs> Moses, you see, this is sometimes misunderstood, but Moses was trying to, uh, I think, to uh, humanize the thing. There's a great stress on the sanctity of human life, as you can see in the provision for capital punishment to be imposed for the violation of life. Offenses against property are generally played down. This is an expression of the tribal nomad's sense of communal possession and economic equality. But capital punishment is to be imposed for insults against God, rejection of his authority, the worshiping of any other god, the making of an image even of Yahweh himself, the sacred bull image. The basic notes are absolute authoritarianism so far as God's authority is concerned. But no earthly ruler, God alone is king of Israel and all others are equal before him. There's a political egalitarianism and an economic egalitarianism. There's rough tribal justice tempered by mercy toward the weak. Tribal responsibility and collective guilt. For I, Yahweh, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the guilt of the fathers upon the children to the third and the fourth generation, but showing kindness to the thousandth generation of those that love me and obey my orders. Now, upon such few simple commandments, others were piled. Hundreds of dietary and Sabbath regulations amounting finally to 613, uh, which the pious Jew is supposed to observe. Whatever the historical value of stories like the Ten Plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea, and the revelation on Mount Sinai, the account left a lasting psychological impression on the whole Hebrew people, similar in function to a myth. The story of the Exodus became the symbol of Jewish history, religion, and nationhood. And the Ten Commandments, whose revelation at Sinai is the high point of the whole narrative, became the foundation of what we call the Judeo-Christian ethic, as well as of much of Islamic tradition. The accompanying material, that is what went along with it, what was piled on top of it, has had much effect on these three religions, but much more on Judaism. From this uh, legal material, we can make the following generalizations. One, the rules are formulated as expressions of God's will only. I am the Lord thy God who hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no strange gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thyself a graven image, the likeness of anything that is in the heavens above or in the earth below or in the waters that are under the earth. Two, they are promulgated to the people at large. Three, the people at large are held responsible for their observance. Get him in here and make him do it if he says no. For obedience is somehow conceived as a quid pro quo. That is, there's not an absolute prostration before God as you find in, in Islam. Uh, God makes an agreement with you. The quo in this case was liberation from Egypt, liberation from slavery. Five, the worship or service of other gods is forbidden. Six, all recourse to magic is banned. Seven, the use of images is banned, probably because they suggest magical control of the deity. 
Uh, and finally, sacrifice is interpreted as a tribute rather than as a giving to God what he needs. Uh, this is a new note. Moses died without entering the promised land. He was the central figure of the epic. In a true sense, it may be said that he made the Jews his chosen people, for he devoted his whole life to an attempt to shape their mentality and their conduct forever. The Jewish community, as we now call it, was his project. And to them, he was the great liberator, leader, lawgiver, and the father of the prophets. Although no convincing external evidence exists uh, that there ever was such a man, the subsequent history of the Jews was profoundly affected by the belief that there was. After his death, the tradition continues, his successor Joshua led the Hebrews across the Jordan, conquered Jericho, subdued much of Canaan west of the Jordan in the 13th century B.C. Now, actually, the conquest was by gradual incursions, and Joshua may have had nothing to do with Moses or with any of the tribes that had been in and around Egypt. What seems to have happened is that one group of tribes in the south, saying they had been led out of Egypt by Moses, persuaded the northern group of tribes to accept the whole Mosaic tradition and covenant as their own. This new confederation of peoples was based on the idea that they're of one God to be worshipped by us. This is our God. This one God was regarded as the sole king of the whole confederation and his authority was exercised by charismatic military and political leaders called judges. The era of the judges was characterized by a continuing war to conquer the rest of Canaan and to abolish the Canaanite fertility cults to which the Hebrews were perpetually succumbing. The whole people now came to be called Israel after the alternate name of Jacob from which the tribes, the northern and southern tribes, were both descended. Israel, however, continued to be surrounded by hostile peoples. The confederation was too loose for safety. And what might be called a more perfect union was called for. This involved having a king, quote, like other people, having a king. Such a choice was a radical departure from the tradition of tribal life with the god Yahweh as the only king. From now on, there was a tremendous sense of tension between those who wanted to settle down and live as the Canaanites and those who wished to perpetuate the severe tribal traditions, which meant, among other things, a more collectivistic and egalitarian economics and a puritanical sexual ethic. But finally, the judges gave in to the idea of kingship, and the last great judge, Samuel, anointed Saul as king. Later, another Saul is to try to undo the whole process, as, as we will see. Saul, in turn, was succeeded by David about the year 1000 B.C., David defeated the Philistines, captured Jerusalem from the Canaanites, and made it his capital. The Israelites then completed the process of setting down, settling down rather, to an agricultural and town life. They began to experience in full the tension between that kind of life and life uh, in nomadic circumstances. In Canaan, Every patch of fertile ground had its Baal, or fertility god. Baal. He died at the time of the decay of vegetation, and he came back to life again when the crops began to grow. There were high Baals on the local hills. The dying and rising to life of all these Baals and their female helpers were accompanied by orgiastic festivities. It was absolutely necessary to the science of agriculture that one engage in these rituals. And it was great fun to go to the orgy. And so the Israelites were swept up in all this, adding 
the worship of fertility gods and goddesses to the worship of, of uh, uh, Yahweh. The religion of the Israelites was well on the way toward what you probably know this word syncretism, the merging of uh, incompatible elements. David, meanwhile, made peace with the Phoenicians, built an army, organized the kingdom, and moved the ark to Jerusalem. The ark he deposited in a tent. He brought a new ideology to Judaism, the idea that God had made a parallel covenant with the king, with the king, with the anointed king, channeling his benefits to Israel through the chosen dynasty of David. Henceforth, the great leaders of Israel would be kings, sons of David. Here was the germ of the idea of Messiah. For whenever Israel was subjugated, the people looked for an anointed king of the house of David to arrive, arrive from nowhere and redeem the nation. David also introduced the idea of the inviolability of the king's person and a court rhetoric, rhetoric in which the king was styled son of God. Solomon, David's successor, succeeded him in 965. He concluded treaties with neighboring kings, made numerous diplomatic marriages, established trade relations with many countries, and was in many ways a master of international relations, as you can see from the famous episode with the Queen of Sheba. Internally, he centralized the kingdom, imposed increasingly heavy taxes upon the people, and also forced labor. He built a great temple in Jerusalem to Yahweh in Phoenician style, and also built on the Mount of Olives shrines for all the gods of his wives. Am I going too fast? A little bit. Huh? I slow down. During his reign, the native Canaanite population was largely absorbed, and the worship of their fertility gods flourished along with that of Yahweh. Following Solomon's death, in 928 BC, the dissatisfaction of the northern tribes, the ten northern tribes, over the issues of heavy taxes, forced labor, and royal absolutism led to the secession of a kingdom which called itself Israel, leaving the kingdom in the south around Jerusalem to be called Judah. The kings of the north severed all religious ties with Jerusalem. They set up two northern sanctuaries to Yahweh, they, uh, and they put up the old totem image of the golden uh, young bull or the golden calf as the totem of Yahweh. For the next several generations, the process of syncretism continued in both kingdoms. <laughs> And then the voices of reform were raised. Now come the prophets. The prophets, very important in the history of the Israelites. The prophets had been around since before 1000. They were essentially dancing dervishes who worked themselves up into a religious frenzy, which they called, quote, being full of the spirit of God, unquote. Some of them were Baal worshippers. Others were Yahweh worshippers. They were essentially descendants of the primitive shaman. They gave out oracles. They praised and denounced. They made predictions about both private and public affairs. There were so many of them, there was even a union of prophets. Now a considerable number of these prophets used to go out in the desert, fast, see a vision of Yahweh, and then come back and stand on the street corners of Jerusalem saying, repent, repent, the end is near. Just as we see today, it's a model and archetype of uh, what we see down around Port Authority. Uh, this particular, the, the, there were two kinds of prophets, true prophets and false prophets. The true prophets were the prophets of Yahweh, 
uh, and the false prophets were the Baal prophets, who were more like street corner gypsies reading your palm. The true prophet was often a kind of back to the simple life of the desert type, denouncing urban and civilized life. But we must be careful in evaluating them, for they mixed denunciation of riches with denunciation of plain decadence and dishonesty. Seizure of, they denounced seizure of property by the kings and so on. So we have a kind of package deal situation here. People were asked to choose between earthly pleasures and success plus breaking contracts and robbery plus the fertility gods versus the life of the poor shepherd plus honest and decent living plus the worship of Yahweh. To quote now the prophet Amos, Woe, woe to the city dwellers relaxing on their ivory divans, sprawling on their couches, dining off fresh lamb and fatted veal, crooning to the music of the lute, downing wine by the bowlful, covering themselves with lotions, with never a single thought for the bleeding wounds of the nation. Your Yahweh festivals, I hate them, I scorn them. Your sacrifices, I will not smell their smoke. This is Yahweh speaking, of course, to the prophet. You offer me your gifts, I will not accept them. You offer me fatted cattle, I will not look at them. No more of your hymns for me, I will not listen to your lutes. Instead, let justice well up like fresh water, let honesty roll in full tide. Thus spake Amos. There were many prophets of this kind, Elijah, Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, Micah. They brought a strong movement back to pure Yahwism for a time. But then, after the fall of the northern kingdom to the Assyrians in 722 B.C., there came about a powerful reversion to Baalism and syncretism in the south. The Yahweh prophets were suppressed by King Manasseh. Shrines were erected to the Assyrian gods in the temple, and a kind of penthouse was erected on top of the temple for the worship of the fertility god Adonis, or Tammuz. A shrine also in honor of Ishtar, queen of heaven, was installed in the temple. King Manasseh sacrificed his own son by throwing him into the furnace of the god Moloch. Suddenly, the pendulum swung again and there came a tremendous reaction. With the accession to the throne of Josiah, Manasseh's grandson, he ordered the repair of the temple, and during the repair work that was going on, the high priest Hilkiah, H-I-L-K-I-A-H, claimed that he had found in a corner of the temple the book of the law. This book, he told the king, is the original book of the law of Moses. The king consulted a prophetess who assured him that the book was genuine. The high priest then gave the king a second copy from which he told him he could rule the realm. We call this second copy Deuteronomy, the second law book. The king read the law book. He cleared out all the idols and the sacred prostitutes from the temple. Uh, he took off the penthouse. He tore down the sacred pillars and poles. He, raid, he ranged through the whole kingdom, demolishing the sacred places of the Baals. He then centralized all worship in Jerusalem, bringing in all the local priests uh, into the temple. And thus the income from the sacrifices was brought in too and centralized. The Jerusalem priesthood now had absolute control over the Mosaic tradition and a vested interest in it. From this time onward, this time was 621 B.C., uh, we have uh, the, uh, uh, the coming in of what later uh, became, in the strict sense, Judaism in the time of Nehemiah and Ezra. Israel, the northern kingdom, lasted two centuries uh, 
it was captured by the Assyrians. 25,000 of its inhabitants were deported. But this had happened before the time of uh, Josiah. These were the so-called ten lost tribes. Judah lasted another, 600, uh, another 136 years until it was captured by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who destroyed the temple and deported about 5,000 of the educated classes uh, to Babylon, leaving the others behind. This ruling class in Babylon found comfortable homes for themselves. They did not disintegrate culturally or religiously. They constituted a distinct community in which religious observance increasingly took the place of the active secular life that they had lived in Judah. Their leaders evolved a new system of law and theology, a new concept of the people of Israel as a holy community, even in dispersion, even in diaspora, came into being. The ideal activity of males became no longer being a warrior, but studying, 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 studying the law, studying the law. Suddenly, Babylon was conquered by Cyrus, the, uh, Cyrus the king of Persia, Cyrus the Great, in 538 B.C. Now, he was the adherent of another prophetic religion, Zoroastrianism, into which we do not have time to go. He was sympathetic to the Jews, and he allowed them to return to their homeland to rebuild the temple. Groups of exiles, zealous exiles, began to return. Now, the people who had been left behind uh, were the less zealous uh, Hebrews, and their whole attitude was, oh, here they come, back from Babylon. Uh, uh, the temple was rebuilt in 516. Uh, Nehemiah acted as the secular governor for the Iranian king, uh, and Ezra was in charge of the religious aspect of things. Ezra ordered an assembly of all the Jews who had not gone to Babylon. He read the law plus the riot act to them, uh, forcing them to divorce their non-Jewish wives. He instituted a fanatical religious regime, forcing on the people all the strict interpretations of the law that the scribes had arrived at in Babylon. As you can guess, and as the Bible says, there was weeping and gnashing of teeth. As the commentator uh, W.K. Lowther Clark says, quote, no more striking example is to be found in history of the power of a determined minority to influence the course of events than the fact that Judaism, as we now call Hebrew polity, was conceived in Babylonia and imposed on Judea, unquote. During the rest of the fourth century, a large part of the Hebrew Bible was written or edited. This work of writing the Bible had probably started way back in David's time, around 1000. Then the Persian Empire was overthrown by Alexander the Great in 333, and the Hellenization of the Near East began. I want to quote again Clark's biblical commentary, quote, colonies of Greeks were planted all over the vast area, but at least they must have formed at best, they must have formed a small minority of the population. The conquest was effective because it was a spiritual one, and the new civilization was accepted as definitely higher than anything previously known. For the first time, Asiatics were introduced to city-state life, political life. Knowledge of Greek opened the door to drama, philosophy, and science, to athletics, to the cult of the body. A fuller, richer, more secular life could now be lived. Even among the Jews, many succumbed to the new influence." Unquote. There was a profound antithesis between the Greek and Judaic spirits. The base were philosophical differences, reason versus authority, man-centered versus God-centered philosophy. The universal 
orientation, the Hellenistic worldview of Alexander, uh, versus a particularistic orientation among the Jews, our people. These differences came out in daily life. The Greeks were horrified at the Jewish dietary laws and the inability of their Jewish friends to dine with them. They were horrified at the Jewish practice of circumcision, which they regarded as a mutilation of the body. Many Jews, perhaps the majority, definitely wished to adopt Hellenistic civilization to attend the schools and gymnasia. One of the signs of the times was that of enterprising Jewish merchants stationed outside the gymnasia selling artificial foreskins. Many... <laughs> Many, many of the Jewish priests, including the high priests, tried. Uh, they, they, they became half Hellenized or even fully Hellenized. The Jews tried to prevent this, and the Greeks, having no more concept of rights than the Jews, tried to counterimpose their own civilization by force. The Greeks forbade Jewish observance, desecrated the Jewish temple, and many Jews became martyrs or witnesses by death to their beliefs. This was the beginning of the concept of martyrdom. The Feast of Hanukkah is one result of this period. Uh, the Feast of the Purification of the Temple after its desecration by the Greeks. At last the Jews had risen up in force under the Maccabees to win their independence which they kept for 130 years from 164 B.C. to 63 B.C. when they were conquered by the Romans. Under Roman uh, rule, Jewish institutions such as the temple, the priesthood, and the ecclesiastical council received a large measure of autonomy. But pious Jews wanted a society uh, in which the law was strictly enforced. They wanted the complete rule or kingdom of God. Other Jews, less pious, were glad to practice Judaism with moderation and to give thanks to Yahweh for Hellenistic culture uh, and the Roman rule of law. These groups hated each other. Generally, Jews of that time divided into four parties as follows in the order of decreasing acceptance of Hellenistic culture under Roman law. First, the Sadducees, a conservative party an urban party formed about 200 B.C. of priests, leading families, and wealthy merchants. They were in charge of the temple and the sacrificial cult, which they held in high regard. They accepted only the written law, not the oral tradition from Babylon. They accepted the five books of Moses. They rejected the oral law, which had been built up in Babylon. They did not believe in life after death of any kind. They rejected the existence of angels, beliefs that the Jews had apparently picked up in Babylon. They were hated by the common people for their external, minimal religion and for their obvious partnership with the Romans. Then the Pharisees, who came in about 140 B.C., the most popular party. When I say parties here, I'm referring to divisions or sects not celebrations. The, the, the Pharisees were the most popular parties. They strictly observed both the written and oral laws, trying to adapt them by ingenious interpretations to change conditions. Their attitude was obsessively legalistic, but they tried to split hairs in such a way as to make life on earth possible. They introduced the institution of the synagogue, which could be set up anywhere in which there were no sacrifices, but simple readings, prayers, uh, and sermons. Under them, the study of the law became a duty of every Jew. The authority on the law, or rabbi, was a Pharisee institution. They believed in the resurrection of the dead, the literal physical resurrection of the dead and the last judgment, beliefs which they may have gotten from the Zoroastrians who also had precisely these beliefs. Then there were the Zealots founded about 6 AD who advocated violence and terrorism 
to overthrow the Roman occupation. They looked for a military Messiah to lead them. Then there were there was the Dead Sea sect or Essenes, E double S E N E S, which had their origin about 140 uh, N B C in their center in the desert northwest of the Dead Sea. Although some of them lived in the towns and villages throughout the land. They emphasized ritual purity to an extreme degree. They engaged in continual ritual immersions of a baptismal nature. They advocated communal property and celibacy. It seems likely that John the Baptist had something to do with these people, the Essenes. It was during this period that Christianity arose as a fifth sect among the Jews. Within a generation, it had partly split off from Judaism. But before the split was complete, the Jewish world was once again shattered. Increasing tensions in Judea, caused partly by Roman tyranny and partly by growing messianic fervor among the Jews, led to confrontation. The Romans decisively crushed a Jewish revolt in 66 A.D. In 70 A.D., they captured Jerusalem, destroyed it amid a scene of unbelievable slaughter, and burned and razed the temple. Only one wall was left standing. You heard about this wall? The, the Wailing Wall, yes. It has remained the holiest place uh, for Jews to this day, and of course, Something else has been built on the, on the scene, uh, the mo mosque, the second holiest mosque in Islam. So again, there's total confrontation, the role of religion in history. The zealots held out and holed themselves up in the fortress of Masada, where in 73 AD they committed suicide in order to avoid being killed or captured by the Romans. Meanwhile, the Romans took the sacred paraphernalia of the temple to Rome, carried it in triumphal procession, an event commemorated in the Arch of Titus in Rome, which may still be seen today. A final revolt occurred in 132 AD under a man named Simeon Bar Kokhba, who proclaimed himself the Messiah and fought the Romans for three years. After he was defeated, the Romans banned all Jews from Jerusalem and they built on its ruins another city, a Roman city, Aelia Capitolina. In spite of these colossal defeats, the, Rome, the Jews reformed their lines in exile and became a worldwide religion on an ethnic basis, but open to any proselyte ready to live under the increasingly difficult Jewish law. In 69 AD, a learned academy was founded at Jabne, Jabne on the coastal plain, also called Jamnia. And this academy fixed the number of books of the Bible. And uh, this is the beginning of what one might call normative Judaism, when you have a written down rule uh, which, uh, uh, in which there is general agreement by the whole community and everybody is expected to live by. The body of authoritative commentary called the Talmud was completed in Babylon by 500 AD. Since that time, Judaism has had a rich history, but its essential philosophical and religious position has remained the same. I've carried up Judaism to the birth of Christianity just as I'm going to try to carry Christianity up to the birth of Islam. Now, the essentials of the Judaic position from a philosophical overview. Like Hinduism, it is a religion of a people. But it is not the product of a slow growth of customs and institutions like Hinduism. Instead, like Buddhism, it, cont it contains a coherent message, something proclaimed as a new way of life. The message proclaimed is, Hear, O Israel, there is but one God. Now, 
monotheism, denying the existence of other gods. This message is addressed to one people, the chosen ones. They are to leave behind them the flesh pots of the goyim, of the Gentiles, and to lead a pure life following a strict law. If they do this, they will survive as a group, but in a peculiar sense of survive as a group. What is guaranteed is not the survival of all Jews as individuals, but that there will always be Jews, descendants of the present Jews, plus some proselytes thoroughly scrubbed down. Uh, but also, if they follow the law, that means they will be, they will be persecuted. So, if they don't follow the law, the foreign people will attack them. If they do follow the law, they'll be persecuted for it, as every proselyte has, has learned. Therefore, every Jew is damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. And if persecution ceases, that means that Jews must be assimilating and Jewish identity is being lost. The essential thing seems to be the survival of tra certain traditions and practices. Now we go to Christianity. The question of the origin of Christianity is a matter of intense controversy. The storm center of the controversy is the central figure of the religion, Jesus. Did he even exist, and if so, can we say anything definite about him? If he never existed, how can we explain the origin of Christianity? And even if he did exist, how would that explain the origin of Christianity? <laughs> Immense resources of scholarship have been brought to bear pro and con on these questions. The overwhelming majority of scholars hold that Jesus did exist and that we can know at least a few things about him. A tiny, unconvinced minority hold that he never existed and that therefore there's nothing to know about him except that he is the central character of a myth. Some of the reasons for this difference of opinion lies in the philosophical positions of the scholars who study the documents, but others seem to be ideologically motivated. Obviously, you would expect those who were Christians to argue for the existence of Jesus and those who were non-Christians to be glad to consign the whole subject to the sphere of mythology. But this is not entirely true. The vast majority of non-Christian scholars hold that Jesus really existed, and a very few professedly Christian scholars have expressed doubt or disbelief about his existence, holding the quasi-Kantian position that what matters about Jesus is not that he, whether he existed or not, but the question of his value, not the fact. All this should lead us to suspect that there are genuine problems in framing the right questions, in gathering and selecting the data, and in assessing the evidence. And this, I think, is the case. All historians, especially ancient historians, know how difficult it is to decide between hypotheses as to exactly what must have happened to explain the existence of such and such historical data. My present opinion, present underlined, is that in the case of Jesus, we simply do not know for certain anything about his biography, not even that he existed. Nevertheless, we have to explain the origin of Christianity. And in so doing, we have to choose between two alternatives. One alternative is to say that it originated in a myth which was later dressed up as history. The other is to say that it existed with one historical individual who was later mythologized into a supernatural being. The theory that Jesus was originally a myth is called the Christ myth theory. And the theory that he was a historical individual is called the historical Jesus theory. My present uh, position is that the Christ myth theory is less probable. For the Christ myth theory presupposes that before the appearance of the story of Jesus in the Gospels, the mystery religions of the Hellenistic world were already of such a nature that they could be regarded as the originals of Christ and Christianity as the borrowed. I do not think that this is so. I do not deny that Christianity is a mystery religion, 
but I hold that it's a largely original mystery religion. Uh, but I think it's more probable that Christianity started within the milieu of relatively orthodox Messianic Judaism and later developed into a mystery religion whose theology was more convincing than the rest precisely because it had a historical base and always took this base for granted. At any rate, the Gospels say that the public career of Jesus began with his encounter with John the Baptist, a figure whose existence is historically authenticated by the historian Josephus. John, according to the Gospels, was another prophet in the long desert tradition. He came dressed in camel's hair and subsisting on a diet of locusts and wild honey, baptizing people in the Jordan, saying, Repent, the kingdom of God is near. It does you no good to be Jews. You've defiled yourself as much as Gentiles. So in order to be saved from the wrath to come, you must be given a purificatory bath here in the Jordan, just like the proselytes, and you must live a completely different life. What shall we do? The people asked John. John answered, Let everyone who possesses two shirts share with him who has none, and let him who has food do likewise. Unquote. So we have the notes of the kingdom of God, essentially an egalitarian, nomadic tribe ruled by an invisible God. Bringing in of this rule, not by Joshua and his legions, but by a supernatural apocalyptic force, a sort of religious science fiction. Repentance, in the sense not only of being sorry, but of radically reforming one's life. Immersion, or baptism, to use the Greek word, now an act imposed on all by the Dead Sea sect whose great settlement was in the desert next door to where John was preaching. And finally, primitive communism of the tribe, a major ideal of the Judeo-Christian ethic. Now John said that he was preparing the way for the kingdom to come. The Gospels say that John was at the same time declaring that one mightier than he would come after him. Whether he said this or not is a question. Then Jesus arrived and was baptized by John. After his baptism, Jesus went out into the wilderness where he endured temptations again, out into the wilderness to endure the temptations and visions, thus repeating the pattern of the primitive shamans as Moses had as the monks of the desert would after him. Then after he had heard that John the Baptist had been arrested for sedition, Jesus went into his home province of Galilee, where he began to call disciples. Then he began to teach in the synagogue, preaching authoritatively. Then he began to act as an exorcist and healer, claiming the power to forgive sins. He ate with non-observant Jews and tax collectors, explaining he had come to call sinners. He said that his disciples did not fast because he was present with them. Like some, some other claimants to the messianic role, he excused his disciples and others for violating the Sabbath rules, uh, saying that the Sabbath was made for man. He appointed 12 envoys to send out to do the same work he was doing. The relevant question here is what was he doing or what did he think he was doing? There's no question that he thought he was a divine agent, that is, the unique agent of Yahweh sent to bring in the kingdom of God. He would do half the job, God would do his half. Jesus would demonstrate by his conduct and bearing what it was like to live the spirit behind the law as he interpreted it. As I understand it, what he was advocating and trying to show by his example was unlimited unconditional, totally self-abnegating love for others, called in Greek agape, the giving of undeserved love, agape, unearned love, groundless love, even for those who don't deserve it, above all for those who don't deserve it. 
And this on the ground that on principle there is no such thing as deserving. On principle all are equally at fault because Yahweh necessarily demands the impossible of man, total purity of motive and intention. You have heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, you are not to resist injury. Whoever strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other to him as well. Whoever wants to sue you for your shirt, give him your shirt and your coat. Give to all beggars. You have heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, whoever looks on a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So don't cast the first stone for no one has ever been able to live up to this ethic because it is not made to be lived up to. In the kingdom, the, the kingdom of God is already invading our world and it is time to begin acting like this. I will show you how it can be done. Now every Messiah is supposed to be successful. Such an ethic cannot be successful. It leads to extinction, not to survival. But suppose that God were to step in and restructure reality so that values of this kind lead not only to survival but to triumph. That would indeed be the kingdom of God. Worthiness to live would be united with efficacy. All Jesus would have to do would be to live his values to the bitter end. There was an old Jewish principle that said that the Messiah would come the day that the whole law was observed throughout Israel. Jesus determined himself in his own person to observe the spirit of the law as he understood it for one full day, Good Friday. At Passover, perhaps around the year 30 AD, he decided to go to Jerusalem to lay, uh, to, uh, lay down a challenge to the religious establishment there. He would call all the Jews gathered for the feast to a decision between his ethic and that of the temple priesthood. He entered Jerusalem apparently to some popular acclaim, but in the next few days he seemed to be hesitant and even ambivalent. For instance, he staged a demonstration to clear the buyers and sellers of animals out of the temple courtyard, supposedly in order to purify it. But then he let drop a cryptic remark saying that he could destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Apparently he believed that his symbolic actions would set in motion a kind of cosmic change, that God would intervene miraculously and set him up as Messiah. Or perhaps he had a more complex belief. This was not to be the case. God did not intervene. If one shoots a lion, one must shoot to kill. The lion, that is the priesthood, had him apprehended swiftly in the night and turned him over to the Roman authorities on charge of claiming to be the king of Israel. And so he was executed by the Roman method of crucifixion. Uh, his disciples were left despondent. But shortly thereafter, his tomb was reported empty and word got around that he had risen from the dead and was appearing to his disciples. The disciples were also searching the scriptures and finding texts that seemed to prophesy that the Messiah would die before coming in glory. A few weeks later, an assembly of disciples gathered to celebrate the Jewish holiday of Shavuot, which marked the wheat harvest and the Sinai covenant. They broke out suddenly into ecstatic speaking with tongues and they went into the streets to proclaim the good news of the suffering and resurrected Messiah who was soon to return and set up his kingdom. They made a sizable number of converts and soon began to form a community, a large number of whose members were poor. These poor members had to be supported by the whole group uh, who were awaiting the return of Jesus in glory. So the more prosperous members sold their property to make this support possible. The whole group were very observant Jews and so were at first tolerated. But soon a group of Hellenistic Jews grew up around the community, a group whose outspoken leader, Stephen, taught that the coming of Jesus abrogated the temple and the law. The Jewish ecclesiastical authorities had Stephen stoned to death for this blasphemy, not for being a Christian. 
for the blasphemy. And an approving witness to the execution was a man named Saul. Saul was one of the most important men in the history of the world, for it was he who later transplanted Christianity from its Jewish base to the Gentile world, transformed it from a Jewish sect into a new and powerful world religion, and by these actions he destroyed the Greek world. He started out as a zealous Orthodox Jew. He was against the Jesus party because no matter how Orthodox they were in practice, they were a threat to the survival of Judaism. Now, why were they a threat to the survival of Judaism? Because of the situation they faced in spreading their movement. Gentiles were being committed to belief in Jesus. Now, the practice of the Jesus party in Jerusalem was to accept such converts only if they first converted to Judaism, were circumcised, and observed the law. Only then were they baptized in the name of Jesus. But now a problem arose. The Hellenistic synagogues had an institution known as the God-fearers, or fringe of the synagogue. These were Gentiles who, although attracted to Judaism, did not want to be circumcised and to obey the dietary laws. They were allowed to become honorary Jews and attend the synagogue, provided they observed a simplified form of the law. They were allies and friends, but not for intermarrying and not for dining together. Now, many such honorary Jews were attracted to the Jesus preaching for obvious reasons. He was represented as one who preached the spirit, not the letter of the law. He wasn't a stickler for points. He had been... Uh, persecuted by the establishment, both Gentile and Jewish. He was the friend of outcasts. These people wanted to join the new movement. They began to speak with tongues, too. And the leaders of the Jesus sect had to do something about all these guys speaking with tongues. They agreed to baptize, finally, all Gentiles who would live by the law of the God-fearers. But there was a problem. This problem was that the very center of the new sex life was a communal meal, the Lord's Supper. At first, the leaders tried to enforce separate tables for this, but the pressure was growing. Saul must have seen the problem clearly. A Christianity centered in Judaism was impossible, for the law would be breached. The Gentile members would soon overwhelm the Jewish, so one or the other must go. So the Jesus sect must go. So he participated vigorously in the persecution of this sect. But subconsciously, he must have realized that he had leaped too quickly from the premise that one or the other must go to the conclusion that the Jesus sect must go. Great tension built up in his mind. And one day he had a vision of the risen Jesus saying, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the pricks, isn't it? Unquote. Implying, of course, you see that the persecution was a defense mechanism. Saul was immediately baptized, but he did not associate with the leaders in Jerusalem, the leaders of the Jesus sect. He remained isolated. He went out into the Arabian desert uh, and meditated. Then he returned to preach his distinctive theology, which in effect uh, transform the Jesus sect into Christianity as we know it. By the time of the early Christians, the Hellenistic world which surrounded them was not exactly characterized by undiluted happiness. The individual felt that a burden pressed upon him. In his deepest soul, he felt he was in the hands of alien powers. Now, I see that it's getting late and... Uh, I could stop here for the question period, or I could go on. What would you prefer that I do? How many people want me to stop here for the question period? Uh, I see that's a The majority of you want me to go on. Okay, and you can, I'll try to make the next lecture shorter, and you can ask more questions then. The Hellenistic individual felt that the, he was in the hands of alien powers. These powers might be the stars pursuing their fateful course across the heavens, or it might be ananke, impersonal necessity, uh, or it might be heartless, capricious chance. 
None of these could be influenced by the prayers of a poor mortal. Man was alone and afraid in a world he never made, as A.E. Hausman said. His soul lay in the prison of the body and could not free itself. Therefore, said some, enjoy the good things of this world, for afterwards your soul will perish with your body. This answer was to be found in inscriptions. It's still found in inscriptions on gravestones all around the Mediterranean. Others agree. Life is full of pain and sorrow. Where have you heard that before? Life is Buddhism, yes. Uh, it, was the, it was the same cry that, uh, that life was worthless that had gone up in India. It's the great disgust period now of the Western world. Just as many people preached a message of alienation and disgust, many of them preached a redemption, redemption or salvation. This message was preached in the mystery religions and in Gnosticism. It's impossible in this lecture to ferret out the various strands of the mystery religions, but a few words perhaps can summarize. They preached the doctrine of redemption. They taught that the soul of man was of divine origin, but that some ancient crime had plunged it into the lower world. This world was the lower world. It was controlled by hostile powers, demons in fact. But a divine savior had descended from a faraway world beyond the stars. He was the bearer of revealed knowledge which he imparted secretly to his disciples. This knowledge called gnosis in, uh, uh, would uh, allow man to outwit the hostile powers to mount up through the seven heavenly spheres and be reunited with the good God who lived beyond the spheres. To do this, one had to identify with the divine Savior, receive his teachings, which were secret, experience the influx of his strength, receive the benefits of his heroic work, uh, and become a member of the religion. Since the body is a part of matter, and since matter is by nature controlled by the hostile powers, Salvation requires extrication from the body. It is not enough to die. It's necessary to die a good death. Remember the Platonic doctrines? Dr. Peikoff has told you about this at length in his course in History of Philosophy. The body is the prison of the soul. Philosophy, the love of wisdom, is the preparation for death. Such doctrines are worked out to a logical conclusion in the cult's of the mystery religions and Gnosticism. According to these cults, or some of them at least, proper preparation for death requires complete abstinence from wine, meat, and sex. Some of the priests castrated themselves. At the other extreme, some of them advocated and practiced orgies because they regarded the moral law as part of the repressive establishment. As for the cosmos, it was hostile. Uh, it was evil. Now it was in the face of these mystery cults that uh, Paul uh, preached his faith. For the new Gentile Christians, the Jewish concept of Messiah had no emotional meaning. Without abandoning the concept of Messiah, the Saul, who now called himself Paul, substituted for it the concept of divine savior, which he found at hand in the Hellenistic mystery religions. The term Christ, or Greek for Messiah, he made into a personal name, Jesus Christ. He then made an original contribution to the interpretation of Jesus' death and resurrection. Christ, he declared, was a divine being, but he had humbled himself and come down from heaven and assumed human form and had died on the cross as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Thus he had triumphed over sin. But death was the penalty for sin, and in his resurrection Christ had triumphed over death also. He was now sitting crowned at the right hand of God, and all who had faith and identified with him would come to participate in his death res and resurrection, and so with him gain victory over both sin and death. Now, by this rethinking, Paul captured the sympathy of the Gentiles, for they had been brought up under the influence of the Greek mystery religions. 
To drive his point home, Paul gave a new theological interpretation to the practices of baptism and the Lord's Supper, practices universal among Christians. By the mystical experience of baptism, he thought, he taught, those who believe may identify themselves with Christ in his death and resurrection. Going down into the water in baptism is an act of identification with his death, while emerging from the water is an act of identification with his resurrection. By this death in Christ, sin and death are wiped away, and the newly baptized Christian lives a new life. This is obviously a revival of the primitive initiation ceremony again, you see. Remember how the initiate is made to undergo a ritual death by cutting off some part of his body. Then he's made a full member of the tribe and is reborn to a new life. Now, here's the crux of the matter. The question arises, of what tribe is the initiate made a member? The answer which Paul gives is, the Christian church, which he identifies with the body of Christ. I pointed out in my remarks on Judaism that the identification with the tribe is the basic idea, not identification with God. I also said that in a mystery religion, the identification with the God is the important thing. In his new interpretation, Paul merges the two ideas. Christ's body means both himself and the church, the new tribe. In order to weld together the two parts of this ambiguity, a unifying theme is introduced. We become one body by eating him. Now, since the broken bread symbolizes broken body and the wine the blood, it's obvious that this eating and drinking is the participation in the sacrifice of the cross. The Eucharist is a meal on the body of the slain victim. The Christian appropriates the strength of the victim and becomes one body with him. Paul had thus revived in his doctrine of baptism the very primitive concept of initiation and in his doctrine of the Eucharist a very primitive doctrine of feeding upon a sacrifice. In this case, a human sacrifice. It must not be thought that Paul is mechanically borrowing from the mystery religions. As a matter of fact, they do not have the unique power and force of his conceptions. What Paul has done is to create, working largely on Jewish materials, the most sensational and well-thought-out mystery religion that has ever existed. Thank you. Now my uh, 